Hi, this is Sarah. I apologize. I've taken so long. So I have this little bullet thing right here. So if you want to like pretend to shoot me, you can. I'm going to start with um, looking back on girlhood. In giving this brief account of my childhood, or to speak exactly, of the surroundings which have affected the course of my work as a writer, my first thought lies back to those who taught me to observe and to know the deep pleasures of simple things and to be interested in the lives of people about me, with its high hills and pine forests, and all its ponds and brooks and distant mountain views. There are few such delightful country towns in New England as the one where I was born, being one of the oldest colonial settlements that is full of interesting traditions and relics of the early inhabitants, both Indian and Englishmen. Two large rivers join just below the village at the head of the tidewater, and these, with the great inflow from the sea, make a magnificent stream, bordered on its seaward course, now by high wooded banks of dark pines and hemlocks, and again by lovely green fields that slope gently to long lines of willows at the water's edge. There is never-ending pleasure in making oneself familiar with such a region. One may travel at home in the most literal sense, and be always learning history, geography, botany, or biography, whatever one chooses. I have had a good deal of journeying in my life and taken great delight in it, but I have never taken greater delight than in my roads, rides and drives, and tramps and voyages within the borders of my native town. There is always something fresh, something to be traced or discovered, something particularly to be remembered. One grows rich in memories and associations. I believe that we should know our native town much better than most of us do, and never let ourselves be strangers at home. Particularly with one's native place is so really interesting as my own, or with me. My grandfather died in my eleventh year, <coughs> and presently the Civil War began. From that time, the simple village life was at an end. Its provincial character was fading out. Shipping was at a disadvantage, and there was no more bronze sea captains coming to dine and talk about their voyages. No more bags of filberts or oranges for the children, or great red jars of olives. But in these childish years, I had come to contact with my delightful men and women of real individuality and breadth of character, who had fought the battle of life to good advantage, and sometimes against great odds. In these days, I was given to long, childish illnesses, and it must be honestly confessed to instant drooping if ever I were shut up in school. I had apparently not the slightest desire for learning, but my father was always ready to let me be his companion in long drives about the country. In my grandfather's business household, my father, unconscious of tonnage and timber measurement, of the markets of the Windward Islands, or the Mediterranean port, had taken to his book, as old people said, and gone to college, and begun that devotion to the study of medicine which only ended with his life. I have tried already to give some idea of my father's character in my story, The Country Doctor, but all that is inadequate to the gifts and character of the man himself, he gave me my first and best knowledge of books by his own delight and dependence upon them, and ruled my early attempts at writing for the severity and simplicity of his own good taste. Don't try to write about people and things. Tell them just as they are. How often my young ears heard these words without comprehending them, but while I was too young and thoughtless to share an enthusiasm for Stern or Fielding and Smollett or Don Quixote, my mother and grandmother were leading me into the pleasant ways of pride and prejudice and the scenes of clerical life and the delightful stories of Miss Olympian. The old house was well provided from leather-bound books of a deeply serious nature, but in my youthful appetite for knowledge, I could even in the driest find something vital, and in the more entertaining, I was completely lost. My father had inherited from his father an amazing knowledge of human nature, and from his mother's French ancestry, that particularly French trait called guillette de cure, through all the heavy responsibilities and anxieties of his personal, busy, professional life. This kept him young at heart and cheerful. His visits to his patients were often made perfectly delightful and refreshing to them by his kind heart. 
and the charm of his personality. I knew many of the patients whom he visited used to visit in lonely inland farms or on the seacoast in Yorks and Wells. I used to follow him about silently, like an undemanding little dog, content to follow at his heels. I had no consciousness of watching or listening, or indeed of any special interest in the country interiors. In fact, when time came that my own world of imagination was more real to me than any other, I was sometimes perplexed at my father's directing my attention to certain points of interest in the character of surroundings of our acquaintances. I cannot help believing that he recognized, long before I did myself, in what direction the current of purpose in my life was setting. Now, as I write my sketches of country life, I remember again and again the wise things he said and the sights he made me see. He was only impatient with, a, with affection and insincerity. I may be inherited something. I may have inherited something of my father's and my grandfather's knowledge of human nature. But my father never lost a chance of trying to teach me to observe. I owe a great deal to his patience for the heedless little girl, given far more to dreams than to accuracy, and with perhaps too little natural sympathy for the dreams of others. The quiet village life, the dull routine of farming or mill life, early becoming interesting to me, I was taught to find everything that an imaginative child could ask in the simple things close at hand. I say these things eagerly because I long to impress upon every boy and girl this truth that it's not one's surroundings that can help or hinder, it is having a growing purpose in one's life to make the most of whatever is in one's reach. If you have but a few good books, learn those to the very heart of them. Don't for one moment believe that if you had different surroundings and opportunities, you would find the upward path any easier to climb. One condition is like another, if you have not the determination and the power to grow in yourself. I was still a child when I began to write down the things I was thinking about, but at first I always made rhymes and found prose so difficult that a school composition was a terror to me, and I did not remember ever writing one that was worth anything. But in course of time, rhymes themselves became difficult, and prose more and more enticing, and I began my work in life most happy to finding that I was to write of those country characters and rural landscapes to which I myself belonged, and which I had been taught to love with all my heart. I was between 19 and 20 when my first sketch was accepted by Mr. Howells of the Atlantic. I already counted myself as by no means a new contributor to one or two other magazines, Young Folks and the Riverside, but I had no literary friends at court. I was very shy about speaking at my work at home, and even sent it to the magazine under an assumed name, and then was timid about asking the postmistress for those mysterious and exciting editorial letters that she announced upon the post office list, as if they were a stranger in town. That is uh, Sarah Owen Jewett, who wrote Looking Back on Girlhood for the Youth Companion Magazine. It was published in the issue January 7, 1892, near the end of her long career as a writer. She published at least 146 stories between 1868 and 1904. Jewett's reminiscence of how she became a writer is marked by the same sympathy for others and love of her native landscape that permeates her local color fiction. As the critic Richard Carey once has noted, her lucid and unassuming prose style conveys her marked regard to the significance 